Hello again, Internet. I'm Lambo. Welcome to my gaming space, more affectionately known as The Nerdery. And I've been busy building one scenario over here, getting it all set up, then I'll go finish painting it and do some other stuff. I've got another terrain project I've been working over here. Uh, but in addition, the reason you're here today is because we're going to cover some more monster AI movement rules. And this time, we're going to get into the nitty-gritty, going into the first ten scenarios or questions found on the Board Game Geek Forum's Gloomhaven Rules Quiz, or the Monster AI Movement Quiz. So, we're going to cover the first ten scenarios. I'll do it on some cool-looking terrain. Well, it's cool-looking to me, I think. And I got some miniatures and stuff to represent all the standees. And then we'll cover the explanations of why the rules work the way they do. So, if you have any questions or comments after watching the video, drop them down below. But you can find the best explanations, besides finding them in the rules, on that Board Game Geek forum. So, why don't you come join me, and as a wise individual by the name of Dustin from Hawkins, Indiana once said, on this curiosity voyage, and these books, these books are our paddles. We need our paddles. Mr. Anderson! I need my paddle! <laughs> so, thanks for joining me, and hope you enjoy this video. All right, welcome to your Gloomhaven Monster AI Movement Quiz, or also known as the Gloomhaven Rules Quiz, as found on the Board Game Geek Forum. This quiz was originally posted by a user who goes by the name of Broster House, and it was then updated to reflect the Gloomhaven second release and FAQ by a user who goes by the name of Sadget. While I make no claims of possessing a doctorate in Gloomhavenology, these folks sure seem to know their stuff, so I'm citing them as my sources up front. My other disclaimer up front is that while I am utilizing monster minis, and will even call them by their Gloomhaven monster names at times, the quiz only ever identifies these monsters as generic monsters. Therefore, while I am attempting to utilize monster minis which would make sense given the quiz stats and abilities for any given question, I may inadvertently utilize a monster which has some extra ability or stat in a real game which isn't present here in this quiz. So, for all you rules and stats experts out there in YouTube land, for the purposes of this series of videos, please only focus on the stats and abilities specifically mentioned in each question, as they are the only ones pertinent to the scenario. My minis and monster identifiers are only there to make this slightly more interesting to you, the viewer, and in no way reflect any extra stats not posted in the scenarios. Okay, now that we have all that out of the way, let's go down to the Inox encampment where it would appear that the Inox residents have come to line up and greet their fellow Inox, the Brute. Likely to thank him for the wonderful job he did in babysitting all their children at the back of the cave in Scenario 3. Inox 1, there in the back, is up, and he has one movement and a melee attack. So, how does he move? Does he move to Space A? Or to Space B? Is it the player's choice, or will he stay put? To solve this question... First, the Inox must find a focus, in this case that is the Brute. Then the Inox must find a hex from where it could perform its current attack and utilize the shortest path to attempt to do so. Viable hexes to perform a melee attack are here, or here, or any of these rear hexes down here, but clearly the shortest path will either lead to here or here. So, to get to one of these hexes is 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3. Or he could go through his allies, 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3. It is the same amount of movement, no matter which way the Inox goes. Therefore, since it is the same to either side, the monster, with his one movement, may either go to the left or to the right, because either one of these two hexes puts him now one, two hexes away from a viable melee attack location. Or if it was here, it would also be one, two movement hexes away. Question two. This is the exact same scenario as before, except all the Inox have apparently moonwalked back one hex. It is again Monster 1's turn in the back to activate. So, the question remains the same as before. With his one movement and melee attack, will the Inox move to space A, space B, player's choice either side, or stay put? The answer to this conundrum is in fact option 4, the monster stays put. Now I know some of you watching this are likely having this reaction right now. No. No. It's not true. That's impossible. But 
rest assured, that is indeed the correct answer. And let me explain why. First, the Inox selects a focus by determining the path using the least amount of movement to attack its focus with its current melee attack. Remember, the key to doing this right is to disregard whether the monster has enough movement this round to travel that path, only that the path exists. If it helps, think of the monster's movement as infinite just for the purposes of determining the shortest path. That shortest path is in fact one, two, three hexes through his allies. So if the Inox were to move one hex off to the side, he would still be one, two, three, or three hexes away from being able to conduct a melee attack. Now, I may not be a math magician, but three hexes away is no closer than three hexes away. And if he were on the other side, it would still be three hexes away. So, the Inox will stay put, and probably write a strongly worded letter to Cephala Fair Games about all of this. Question 3. Here, we have the Inox Guard, who now has two movement and a melee attack, and he has two enemies on the board. The Brute, who is currently playing a little hide-and-seek behind the totem, and the Mind Thief, out in the open. Those tokens on the ground represent initiative, so the Mind Thief has initiative 12 this round, and the Brute has 25. The question is, what will the monster do on his turn? Selecting a focus requires us to find the shortest path to conduct the monster's melee attack, but it is 1, 2 hexes to get to here, 1, 2 to get to here, and 1, 2 hexes to get to here. So both of these characters are tied for shortest movement path. In this case, will the monster move to either A or B, player's choice, to attack the brute, or will the monster move to C to attack the mind thief? The answer is the monster move to A or B, player's choice. This is because page 29 of the rulebook states in cases where the monster can move the same number of spaces to get within range of multiple enemy figures, proximity from the model is the first tiebreaker, and that's as the crow flies, counting everything except walls. Therefore, we ignore initiative at this point and first check proximity, and thus we see that the brute is only one, two hexes away, whereas the mind thief is one, two, three hexes away. So the Inox can go right or left and tag, the brute is it. Question 4. In this scenario, we see that the scoundrel has become cornered in some isolated part of the level, probably because she has been doing what every scoundrel player ever in the history of scoundrel players does. Leave the main party, who's probably busy fighting the enemy somewhere, all in order to run ahead and loot something shiny before someone else in the party has a chance to do so. That's right, you know who you are, scoundrel players. The Inox Guard in the back is ready to activate. He has a movement of two and a melee attack, but we see there is also a trap right here. It's a trap! And a space here where he could launch his melee attack from. So here is the question. How does the monster move? Will the Inox move down one space to here? Will he move through the trap to close the distance here? Or will he stay put? The correct answer is the Inox will stay put. This is because the shortest path to attack his focus goes straight through his allies here. One, two, three. The trap is considered a negative hex, and a path exists through here to reach the focus. It's just the monster doesn't have sufficient movement to use it this round. Monsters will always treat traps as obstacles, meaning they won't go through them unless there is no other way to reach their focus. Since there is another way, the Inox will do what my dog does when I tell him to get off my couch and stay right where he is. Question 5. A little change of scenery as we move down into the depths of the dungeon, where we have a series of living corpses, with this living corpse here, uh, with his token denoting who will be activating, all here facing off against the Spellweaver. The living corpse will get three movement this round, and a melee attack. So the question is, how will Monster 1 move? Will the monster move onto space A? Will the monster move on to the trap, or will the monster stay put? The correct answer is the monster will move onto the trap. What? The reason for this is that when the monster targets his focus, he must find a legal hex from which to perform his current melee attack from. This hex is occupied by an ally, so it is not a legal hex to launch an attack from. There is, however, a legal hex here to attack from on this side of the Spellweaver. 
the only path to get here is to travel all the way around these walls, either around the bottom or the top. Therefore, the trap is no longer considered an obstacle, and the living corpse activates by doing a combat roll over his friend, landing on the trap with his final movement, and then suffering the consequences. Uh, this trap would swap out, having been sprung. Sorry, but not sorry, Mr. Living Corpse. Question six. In this scenario, we see the living corpses again lining up in front of the Spellweaver for what I'm sure they've heard is a magical meal, and it is the living corpse with the number tokens turn to activate once more. The living corpse has two movement and a melee attack, so how does it move? Does it move down here to space A, closer to the Spellweaver, or does it move up to space B, to space C? Is it the player's choice between B or C? Or is it the player's choice for any of these hexes, A, B, or C? The correct answer is that the monster will move to either of these two hexes, B or C, player's choice. Why, you ask? Because the monster must find a viable hex to attack from melee range. And as before, this hex is occupied by an ally, making it not a viable hex from which to launch a melee attack. The two closest hexes the monster could attack from are here or here. You could attack from here, but these two are closer. Therefore, since it is 11 movement hexes both this way and around this way, it is up to the players to decide between B or C, and they may move the monster up here or here. Pregunta numero siete. For those that don't habla the espanol, that's question seven. We now head into the caves where the Cragheart is cornered by two vermlings with an Inox archer behind them. It's the archer's turn to activate, and he has two movement and a range to attack. So, what will the archer do? Will he stay put or move through the trap to space A? The correct answer is he will move through the trap to space A. The reason is because with a range 2, the monster needs to find a viable hex from which to conduct his current attack. This hex is occupied, as is this one, both by the monster's allies. These two hexes are occupied by obstacles. That makes the nearest and only viable hex this one here. There is only one path to reach that hex, and when there is no other way to reach a hex in order to conduct an attack, only then will a monster go through a trap, which it does here, springing the trap and moving towards the space from where it can attack its focus. Question 8. In this scenario, we see the Inox Archer taking on three players, the Crackheart, the Mind Thief, and the Tinkerer who has also laid down a poison gas trap over here. The archer has a movement of 2, a range of 2, and a target 3 attack. So what does the archer do? Does he move to one of these hexes back here to lose disadvantage? Does he move down here or here where he can attack all three characters? Or does he step onto the trap, allowing him to attack all three characters and lose a disadvantage on his primary focus? Of the many choices, the correct answer is the Inox will step back to Hex B and then conduct his attack against these two enemies. The reason for this is first the Inox selects his primary focus, which is his nearest enemy, the Cragheart. Because the Archer has a range 2 attack but is in melee range, this attack would be a disadvantaged attack if he were to remain where he is. Monsters always attempt to lose disadvantage on attacks against their primary focus. Monsters also always attempt to maximize their attacks, meaning attack as many as their attack stat allows in this case, but they prioritize losing disadvantage on their primary focus first, then maximizing their attack second. Therefore, the monster will avoid going to any hex adjacent to the Cragheart because his attacks would be done at disadvantage, even though that will mean he cannot attack all three targets. The monster will also treat the trap as an obstacle, because he can conduct an attack against his primary focus from elsewhere on the board. So, the monster will step away from the Cragheart while trying to maximize his attack and not be at disadvantage elsewhere if he can help it, leaving space B as the only space where he can do so. For question 9, the scenario is the same. So, we'll put that archer back where he came from. Put that thing back where it came from, or so help me! So help me! So help me! And cut! But this time, the archer is muddled, so all his attacks are at disadvantage. 
everything else being the same, what does the archer do now? Being muddled, the correct answer is now move to F and attack all three targets. Here's why. The whole reason for stepping back to hex B in the previous question was to lose disadvantage on the primary focus and not be at disadvantage to secondary targets either. With the monster now being muddled, it doesn't matter where he is located. He'll still be attacking at disadvantage regardless. So that negates the need to step away. Therefore, you skip trying to lose disadvantage and move right into simply maximizing the attack. That makes hex F the best location because the archer can attack at maximum effect there, targeting all three targets. Question 10. We made it. The last question of the video. We have a very similar scenario here, except this time I've switched out the archer for a flame demon. The reason I've done this is that this flame demon has the flying trait. He maintains all the same stats as the monster in the previous questions, that being two movement, a range two attack, and target three but he also has gained flying. I've also swapped to a different trap for the Tinkerer, but it's still just a trap. So, with that being the only change, what will the monster do in his turn, given the exact same choices as before? The correct answer is the Flame Demon will move to the trap, and I'm going to tell you why. The Flame Demon first selects its primary focus, that being the Cragheart, and then prioritizes losing disadvantage on its attacks against its primary focus. Then the Flame Demon prioritizes attacking to maximum effect by attacking as many targets as possible, three in this case. That leaves only the trap space as a location where it could attack its primary focus without disadvantage and still hit two additional targets, even though one secondary target will be at disadvantage. Since the monster has flying, it doesn't treat traps as negative hexes, and can simply land over the hex without triggering the trap. To recap, according to the quiz explanation, the order of operations is as follows. 1. Lose disadvantage on primary focus. 2. Gain as many extra targets as possible. And 3. Lose disadvantage on the extra targets. This is why the Flame Demon will pick the trap space over space F because losing disadvantage on the primary target trumps losing disadvantage on the secondary target, and gaining as many extra targets as possible trumps losing disadvantage on the secondary target. There you have it, folks. The first ten questions off the Board Game Geek Monster Movement Rules Quiz. Now, after watching this video and hearing the explanations, some of you might be feeling like this right now. Remember, I didn't write these rules, or these quiz answers for that matter, I'm just the messenger. So you can save your torches and your pitchforks for Cephal Affair Games or the Board Game Geek quiz authors. I just happen to be the sucker who put their answers up in a YouTube video. And there you have it. The first ten questions from the Gloomhaven uh, Monster Rules Quiz or Rules Quiz from the Board Game Geek Forum. Uh, How would we do? Did you guys do well? Or girls? Did you mess up a bunch? Did you learn something? Let me know below. Uh, let me know what you think. Did I mess something up? I am not above getting a rule wrong here or there, which is kind of what started me on this journey in the first place. So, uh, did I mess something up? Uh, if, if I did, let me know. Um, I'll keep putting these out there, uh, these videos, if there's interest in more, uh, and I will get working on it in the near future. I've got to finish doing all this terrain stuff that I'm, I'm working on. If you like terrain videos, you can check out some of those other ones on my channel as well. Uh, but above all, happy gaming.